This week's Jane Doe takes us back to Halloween, 1979, in Georgetown, Texas. Halloween is usually a day filled with mischief and magic. However, for Orange Socks, the day would be marred with tragedy and a mystery that spanned over 40 years. Orange Socks was discovered on October 31st, 1979, in a drainage ditch just off Interstate 35 in Georgetown, Williamson County, Texas. Her cause of death was listed as strangulation and she had extensive bruising on her neck and body. The other bruising came from the fact that she had been thrown from an overpass and dragged through a grassy area. She was also completely naked apart from a pair of orange socks, which led her to be known as the Orange Socks Jane Doe. Identifying Features Jane Doe was estimated to have been between 15 and 30 years old, had 10 inch long brown hair with a reddish tint, hazel eyes and weighed between 140 and 160 pounds. Her legs were unshaven, suggesting that she may have been a drifter or homeless in life without access to shaving products, or it could have be suggested that she preferred the more hippie, modern lifestyle and just preferred not to shave her legs at all in protest of sexist attitudes and the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Jane also had a large number of insect bites, very long toenails and her fingernails had been painted. She also had a hairline scar along her jaw which would aid investigators in the identification of Jane. Her earlobes were described as unique and her toes were longer than average. Whilst these details may seem like small details, 40 years down the line they would lead to the positive identification of our Jane Doe. During her post-mortem it was found that Jane had suffered from sapolingitis, which is an inflammatory infection of the fallopian tubes, which is a direct result of contracting gonorrhea. In life this would have caused Jane Doe some amount of pain and discomfort. Two of her teeth were missing, but it isn't stated whether this was due to her body being thrown over the overpass or through disease in life. The rest of her teeth were well maintained, but showed little sign of dental work or treatment. This told investigators that while Jane did have access to dental treatment in life, she may have been from a working class background or away from a traditional family setting for some time. Another piece of evidence that supported investigators' theory that Jane was a nomad hippie drifter was the fact that she was using a towel instead of period products, possibly in an attempt to avoid spending her much needed cash. Either that or in life, Jane was unable to afford products and had to make do with the best she could with what she had. The main piece of evidence that almost confirmed the drifter theory to police was the fact that Jane was found with two matchbooks, one of which was from a hotel in Henrietta, Oklahoma, which is around a 375 mile drive from Georgetown, Texas, where she was found. Now, before we get into the investigation slash identification part of this video, I want to read a list of women who have been officially ruled out as the Orange Sox Jane Doe. I will present their name, age, at time of their disappearance, location and the circumstances under which they disappeared or slash suspected of being orange socks. Kathleen Rogers, 15 years old, but missing from Oroville, California on March 3rd, 1973. She was 15 years old at the time of her disappearance. She is thought to be a runaway, however, it is now suspected that she was in fact murdered. Sharon Pretorius, 13 years old, went missing from Dayton, Ohio on September 28, 1973. Sharon was to, was believed to have been abducted before being murdered. Pinky Davis Heron, 18 years old, went missing from Delville, Texas on January 1, 1974. Pinky was last seen with her friends on New Year's Eve and has not been seen since. Brenda Davidson, 14 years old went missing from Woodbridge, Virginia on March 4, 1974. Brenda, much like Kathleen, is believed to have been a teenage runaway. Laurie Allison Smith, 23 years old, missing from Tucson, Arizona on February 8, 1977. The circumstances around Laurie's disappearance are believed to have been due to a drug trafficking ring.
Nancy Jason, 19 years old, missing from Chevy Chase, Maryland, on July 20th, 1977. Nancy disappeared before a trip to Florida and sadly has never been seen since. Lisa Borden, 19 years old, missing from Lodi, California on October 10th, 1979. Lisa went missing after planning to fly out from California back to her home in Texas. Lisa was quickly ruled out as her own socks due to the surgical implants that she had in her hands, as these were not found in our Jane Doe. Susan Cook, 30 years old, missing from Clee Ellum, Washington, on June 16th, 1984. Now, Susan's date of disappearance is listed over five years after the discovery of orange socks, so I'm unsure why she was listed as a rule out. There's a possibility that perhaps the date of disappearance is wrong or unknown, but since she is listed officially as a rule out, I, I want to mention her. Investigation. Investigators were left stumped with the case of orange socks due to her being found naked apart from the pair of orange socks. They were unable to look into items of clothing that she may have been wearing and where they, where they may have been manufactured or distributed. The one lead that investigators had was one of the two matchbooks that I mentioned earlier that was found near Jane Doe's body, one of them being from a hotel in Henrietta, Oklahoma. They travelled up to the hotel in question, but without even so much as a first name, an ID card, etc, they were unable to find her on the hotel registry. This was most likely before the time where you would need to submit a piece of ID before you were able to rent a room. The 1970s is synonymous with drifters and hippies hitchhiking their way across the US to find their small slice of paradise, so it's really no surprise that these hotels didn't ask for ID or driver's license before booking a room. In their small lines of inquiries, investigators soon ran into dead ends with every single lead they had, in terms of Orange Sox's identity and the identity of her killer. A small glimmer of hope came in 1982 when serial killer Henry Lee Lucas confessed to the murder of Orange Sox. After picking her up in Oklahoma, he claimed that the pair had consensual sex before they got into Lucas's car. It was at this time when Lucas asked her, so Orange Socks, to have sex with him again, which she declined and said no. In a fit of rage, Lucas murdered the young woman before raping her. It is unknown the exact location of the supposed crime scene, however Lucas did tell authorities that he drove to Georgetown so he could dump her body. Another important clue from Lucas is that he said that Orange Socks had gone by the name Joni or Judy, there is no way of knowing if the police knew he was lying, or if Aaron Sox was possibly using an alias while she had been hitchhiking across the country. Like many of Lucas's confessions, this was recanted. Surprise. He recanted this in 1984 after police attempted to get him tried and convicted for her murder. Governor Bush actually commuted his sentence to life in prison from the death penalty, as only one murder the murder of Orange Sox carried the death penalty. Lucas later died in Huntsville Prison of heart failure on March 12, 2001. Due to the lack of physical evidence and a recanted confession, if Lucas did in fact murder Orange Sox, then it could very well be a secret that he has taken to his grave. In 2001, a photograph surfaced that bore a resemblance to Orange Sox, However, this was ruled out by DNA testing. Other people speculated that Orange Sox was a woman who had gone missing in the 1970s after she was escaping an abusive relationship. Missing person Martha Morrison was also a possible match to Orange Sox, but her remains were found in 2015, officially ruling her out as Orange Sox. The popular TV show America's Most Wanted even featured Orange Sox's case twice since her tragic murder in 1979. This did actually lead to an anonymous tip where a woman claimed to have seen Orange Sox hitchhiking on the day of her murder, but sadly this hasn't given the police or investigators any new information or leads. Now we go to the identification of Orange Sox. The very reason that I'm making this video, the whole purpose of me making is, this video is because 
of the recent updates we've had in the Aaron Sox case. If you follow sort of any true crime news or you know true crime content creators over the past week, you probably will have seen this news story popping up all over the feeds. So I'm going to take you through a brief little timeline of the identification. In 2016, so on the 37th anniversary of her death, NECMEC, which is the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, released brand new composite sketches of orange socks. It wasn't until 2019, so this year, if you're listening to it this year, when orange socks Jane Doe finally had a break in her case. The older sister of a woman named Deborah Jackson contacted the police after seeing the orange sock sketches on the news and believing that orange socks may possibly have been her missing sister, Deborah. Deborah was last seen by her family in Abilene, Texas in 1977, where she left to go and work in Amarillo, Texas. Whilst in Amarillo, Deborah worked at the Ramada Inn before going to work at an assisted living centre in Azale, Texas. After 1979, there were no employment, social security, bank or other records for Deborah. Her family said that they didn't file a missing persons report because they assumed that she'd sort of left to go make her own life and that she was doing okay. They thought it was very much of the time that, you know, young people sort of just drifted off, went and made their own life and, you know, got on with their stuff. Maybe send Christmas cards or whatever, but... I guess because of the hippie drifter culture of the time, it wasn't so uncommon for young people to sort of just venture off from their hometowns. The sister then worked with the Williamson Police Department and the DNA Doe Project to provide a DNA sample for a comparison and hopefully a potential match. The Williamson County Police Department made identification by a comparison of family photos from the Jackson family and autopsy and other forensic photos gathered by investigators over 40 years ago. They also used the unique identifying features of Orange Sox and Deborah Jackson, such as the scars on her lower legs, which her family said were from impetigo that Deborah had suffered in her childhood, along with Deborah's unusually long toes and uniquely shaped earlobes. The DNA Doe Project project then uploaded the sister's DNA to the genealogy database called GEDmatch or GEDmatch which also has the DNA of orange socks on file. Quote, by testing the relative of the direct to consume and DNA test her identification was supported by additional DNA matches that we already had connections with from GEDmatch.com and that's a quote from the DNA Doe project. The Williamson County Police Department had been working on forensic analysis of Orange Sox's evidence since April of 2018, which proves that this case did not just get shoved to the bottom of the pile or the back of the shelf. They had recently submitted fingernail clippings for further DNA testing in the hopes of identifying the male DNA that was found underneath the fingernails. On Wednesday, the 7th of August, at 2pm Eastern Standard Time, Williamson County called a public press conference in which law enforcement and members of the DNA Doe Project were present. Williamson County Sheriff Robert Chody revealed that the grave marked as unidentified woman, 1979, could now be changed to the final resting place of 23-year-old Deborah Jackson, who was last seen by her family in Abilene, Texas in 1979. Thanks to the unwavering hard work of the Williamson County Police Department, the DNA Doe Project and everyone else involved, our Jane Doe is no more. She finally has her name back. Deborah's case is proof that we should never ever give up hope, even after four decades. The only piece in the puzzle of Deborah Jackson is the identity of her killer. I hope for her family that one day another press conference will be held in which we will be finally able to put her case to rest once and for all. If you would like to listen to the whole press conference, I've linked it down below for you. You may or may not need to use a VPN to access it. 
I've also listed all of my sources of information down below. Again, you may have to have a VPN for some of the articles if you're based outside of the US. That's something I had to do, so thanks NordVPN. Thank you for giving Deborah Jackson a moment of your time. I know that Orange Socks has been covered so many times before, but I really wanted to bring an update to her case. I wanted to bring this story the attention that it deserves and to give thanks to the people who've worked so hard and tirelessly on her case. I know that this case has not been forgotten, you know, in the eyes of the people of Georgetown in Texas, the eyes of law, law enforcement, people who researched and worked on her case. I know that this is what ultimately they've been working towards. She deserves to have her name and identity back after 40 years and may she rest in peace. Thank you for tuning in to today's video. If you like the content that I make on this channel, please consider giving me a like and a subscribe. I've linked all my social media down below, including my Patreon. And remember friends, stay safe and stay spooky.